It's so awkward. Cramping my style, man. You're dangling. <laughs> oh, this is childhood slash parenting one. Because Rich has to edit this. When I was a child, I always wanted to do group activities with my friends. I lived with my grandmother because my parents were working too much, so I rarely saw them. My grandmother provided me with love and affection that I truly appreciated. However, due to her overprotective nature, she did not want me to engage in activities that may be dangerous, such as unsupervised swimming, going away for the weekend to camp with friends, when I was three years old, no. or even play soccer at an unfamiliar neighborhood. Although it gets very lonely at times, as I am an only child, but who knows what kind of trouble I might have gotten into if it wasn't for my grandmother's protection. Mm. I was the second girl, I guess, born, bad, second girl, so sorry, does that look? Born. Born, it is, okay, okay. Sorry. Born, Bruce and Marge, I was armored with my older sister? Yeah, uh, and, wow. And I'm um, enamored, yes, thank you, my fault. I was enamored with my older sister. Somebody in here is going, you idiot, that's enamored, it's enamored! I'm amazed how you held back. Armored? Jesus, enamored! I printed it! I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> By the way, way back when, way before a time, was a movie called Love Story. The motto was, love me. You never have to say you're sorry. Oh my God! As a human being who's never been in a relationship. <laughs> the first thing you should say is like when you play tennis, just like, I apologize for the ball going out. Say it right in the beginning. I apologize for any and all ways I'm ever gonna hurt you, because I'm sure I will and I apologize. Even when I don't mean to. Just say you're sorry, 38.3 seconds every time. All right, I had a rich fantasy world. A for the magic mind. I was an, huh, inordin inordinately, maybe, something elite, curious and liked to explore, discover, and learn. I also had a shy nature, and I had a hard time speaking. Our family had fun in the nature we played. In the nature we played, often I have fond memories. Very nice. Again, uh, there are different temperaments. I ask that you say at least one thing in class. I understand that's hard to do. One of the criteria on the um, evaluation is part oral participation and whatnot. So if you never said a word, it makes it really hard. I can't really put non-applicable. All right. When I was a child, I was the only child in my home. I was born as a Surprise, surprise, <laughs> to intact parents with the three almost grown children. Oh, wow. Since my mother was not working at the time, she became my primary caretaker and support. As a, um, as I, as I, something, my childhood memories, as I trust, my childhood memories are filled with images of her and playing pretend in my mom, with my mom probably. I had an early upbringing and am so grateful to have the family that I have. They are my biggest support, that's wonderful. And I fear that I would, will never be able to thank them enough for all they have done for me. Okay. I thought that people who took care of me were all actors playing a joke on me. <laughs> You look like Adam Sandler. <laughs> I always waited for the day they would yell, surprise, you're not really ours, and we don't actually want you. Unquote. The notion of them being actors subsided, but the thought that they cared for me out of obligation rather than desire stuck. I now understand that I'm loved and a source of pride in terms of my achievements for my family but there is still always the whispering question in the back of my mind of whether they love me because they have to or because they want to. And 
And would they love me even if I was not family? I didn't have many friends, nor did I have much interaction with my family, mainly raised by a nanny. My social life was empty. Not saying that I did not have a good childhood, because I did. However, I always look back and remember and am fascinated by the way I was able to entertain myself and fill the void with my imaginary friends that I saw on TV. Those old, cal those old calculator watches always remind me of that time in my life. It was our communication device. LOL. Smiley face. Cool. When I was a child, I lived magically. I was fascinated by everything and I didn't, and didn't feel any limits. I thought I could be anything I wanted. I loved to dance. I wanted to be a prima ballerina. Cool. Mashalom <laughs> ha. I read everything I could see, even science. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I loved school. I cared so much for my parents that I always took a moment to give them a hug and kiss goodbye because I never wanted to take them for granted. I accepted things even if they were unfair and I always tried to include everyone and make peace. When I was a child, I would stay in the sandbox until the neighborhood pole lights came on I'd pretend that the sandbox was my, oh God, this is supposed to be so, what is this, my? House? Oh. Except that looks like a G. I know somebody's saying it's, what do you think, what do you think? Which one? My something. Yeah, it's house. That's house? Like... Okay, looks like a G to me. House, okay. And the, hmm, shields were, oh, sides, I don't know, sides were, I'm so sorry. This is so important. Plates, I guess. Somebody just want to say what this is because somebody's going crazy right now. No, that's okay. You don't have to. All right. Something in sands with additional dishes. So basically, it's a eating set. Uh, my my world. My mom. My mom would call me for dinner by opening the window and. Oh, that overlooked the sandbox. Okay, okay. I remember coming inside, taking off my shoes filled with sand, and running to take a quick bath before dinner. At the dinner table, I'd share my imaginative play stories with my parents and brothers. After dinner, as I laid in bed, I would see residues of sand, and I think, is that sea? Yeah, residues of sand, and think a lot what it something like happen in the sandbox, or what will happen in the sandbox the next day. I'm sorry that I didn't quite say it. Right. When I was a child, I found the world confusing. I remember not understanding things and felt my opportunity to explore the world was limited. I remember getting in trouble for, quote, making a mess, unquote, or was frequently told, quote, don't act like a child, unquote. But I'm only three. How am I supposed to act? When I was a child, I knew I was loved. But that love was sometimes mixed with my dad's explosive anger and my mom's inability to understand her tomboyish daughter. Being my Filipino, being my Filipino parent's child equated respect with love and achievement with value. Part of being a Filipino American child meant love of others before love of self. When I was a child, I was a very happy child. I grew up with a great and loving family. I felt supported in all activities. I tried, don't you love it when they cross something out? Don't you just immediately want to know what that was? Don't you want to go like, okay, we're gonna find out what that word was. I will honor your privacy to maintain your sense of psychological safety and not do that. Because you really, she really intended <laughs> I tried and continued to develop and grow in certain activities. I have many memories of my childhood that I hold near and dear to my heart. Do not read, and I won't, and thank you for putting that right on the top. Otherwise, I would have read it and then felt bad. 
When I was a child, I was shy yet curious in everything. I grew up in a child-centered home with loving parents. My house was like a zoo full of different animals. Beautiful. I've always wondered if I had a sibling that I've never met. I felt as though a part of me was missing. Wow. Approximately 15 to 20 years later, my father explained that my half-sister will be visiting from overseas. Wow. I cannot describe this feeling, but thought that it was interesting. Powerful. When I was a child, I had a chaotic home life. I dealt with this by, f I guess, forming strong bonds with my brothers and sisters. We had our own little world at home that was rich with imaginary play and drama. Another passion of mine was, oh, writing, writing poetry. This helped me to express emotions that were not allowed to be expressed in my home. In many ways, my parents were loving and well-meaning, but our relationship now, relationships now are much more honest and meaningful. When I was a child, I was interested in learning as much as possible about the world around me through whatever means, including taking things apart which annoyed adults. My iPhone, no! Oh, I think, we're, I think that's it. We're there. Thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions, as you wrote that and as you heard me read that. What'd you think? What'd you feel? First thing I thought about when you started reading um, was more so like the common human experience. What's that? Sorry, the what experience? Like common human experience. Oh, the common human experience of childhood. When I was writing mine, I was, I was thinking like, oh, mine can be the only way that it can be like so unique or nobody's going to have the same type of story. And then I was surprised that there was a lot more similar stories. Which I know I've been doing this for a long time. As we've decided some of you were never born even when I started this class. They're, they tend to fall into two groups. One is happy childhoods, and the other is sad, or somehow not feeling connected to child, and some very poignant. But there's a common, of course, there's a commonality. Never mind the human experience, but particularly to the childhood experience. And I do believe, at its core, it's cross-cultural. I know culture has tremendous impact. I don't discount that. We're right as an institution to keep heightening awareness about the impact of culture, no question. Nonetheless, there is a core, various core qualities, experiences, beingnesses of the human species that is transcultural, transhistorical, transpersonal, as Jung talked about archetypes, mm -hmm. but so cool. Other thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions? When I was writing back, it was hard to just kind of condense it all because uh -huh. there's just so much of my childhood that I remember that it was like, okay, well, what do I, I can sit here and write. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really hard, I guess, for me to kind of say what I wanted to say on a piece of paper. Yeah. Please. I didn't really remember. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And, and then you kind of look around and go, oh my God, really? That's what you were as a teenager? Can I see a picture? Like, wow. I was uh, finding difficulty getting a balance between like, being honest but protecting yeah. myself, like sharing something that was true, but not too raw that it would be uncomfortable for people to hear or for me to have read. Fair enough. Our inner protector is an enormously important part, a valuable, important part. It also can become an embracing head, what I call a perverse protector, but there's also the, the rightful protector, and that's interesting. Please. Um, that part, I don't know who it was, but with the calculator watch. Oh, yeah. It made me like, think of how kids can make, they can make like, anything magical. And it could just be something like really boring, like even a sandbox, and they can turn it into a rocket ship. And, and I'm like, dang, you know, I think. It's like, when did we all lose that? Or like, it's, it's kind of weird, because that was like how your life was. It is, a, you're saying something profound. Childhood is truly and honest to godly and neurobiologically a different state of being, a different brain state of being. And you're spending a lot more time in the orbital frontal lobe, in the magic mind. So that it's an absolutely different way of being. And the easiest way to recall it is if I, and I won't have you do this, if all of you got underneath that, those tables of yours and I took a blanket and put a blanket over each one of these tables, you would immediately, including yourself, dear lady, become six years old or younger. You would. And you'd go like, woo, woo. I did that once with, pardon the term, badass drug addict teenagers. I think I told you I ran an inpatient hospital for these really tough ass kids. You'll see a video actually, that last class actually you'll see a video of a group therapy with these kids. And one of the things we did one time, because it was a group room about this size with no furniture, and we got ropes and we strung them and we put sheets and, and we made forts. And they were such little three-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds. They just became these cutie pie kids. We're in the wilds of the Amazon. Lights were kind of dim. Oh my God, it was total magic mind. And they were just like little kids. And I always think that the Middle East talks, they need to get under tables, put the blankets, and let's see. I think I told you that last time. There's ways of retapping that. And that's one of the gifts, and in a way, one of the, for some people, I think, the threats of being with kids and playing with kids and doing therapy with kids is you connect with your own inner child and what all that was. It re -evokes. And it's one of the joys, and in some sense for some folks, the threats of parenting, is the child really is you at age, whatever that age is. It really does evoke all that. So let's talk more about the, that state. I'm not proud of this, but I'll tell you the truth. I was about, uh, let's say I'm in Berkeley, so I'm eight. I figured it out. I figured out how Peter Pan flew. I figured it out. Peter Pan was my favorite book. I love that story. So you need pixie dust. I figured out what pixie dust is. Now here comes the not proud part. Pixie dust really is the stuff on butterfly wings. That's pixie dust. So what you gotta do, I know. I'm sorry. Yeah, for any of you, I, and I hate, I'm sorry. I can barely even kill an ant. I feel bad killing an ant nowadays. I do, I really. I'm so sorry to offend you. I, t I collected a bunch of butterflies. I'm sorry, God, I, I confess. I know I should, I should contribute every year to the Butterfly Association or something. I gotta do my amends, lifetime amends for all the butterflies whose powder I took off. I tried not to kill them, by the way. Most of them I killed, but it probably was better than trying to fly without that stuff, because it is pixie dust and it makes you fly. So I collected, actually, probably the thin layer at the bottom of a jar. Look at these looks. <laughs> All right, camera, turn around, look at these looks. They're like, oh, God, psychological safety on your mind. What about the poor bug? Anyway, so I put it, and sure enough, I got on the bed, honest to God. I put it, and there was, yes, I put it on me, and I put it on the other part of me, two, two wings. I believe, I believe. Whee! And you can do the slow motion, just imagine it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the empathy. Thank you. Very nice. Right. I was so disappointed. It's like, what? 
And I, and I think I was even any extra longer in the air. I was trying to think, well, here was a little longer. No. Kadunk. Now I did think, okay, I just needed more butterflies, but I wasn't going to go. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't. I only did it one time. I was it. Different way of being in the world. Because I really believed. My little inner scientist, you know, I was pretty smart. Came up with, let's see, how does this work? This dust. Picks. Oh, I know who has that. Birds don't have that. But, you know, if you look at the deductive reasoning that's going on, inductive, I'll get those two confused. I think that's inductive reasoning. It's cool. Remember that about what we call play. There's an enormous amount of cognitive myelination going on. That's how you learn to think, is through play. That's why you're able to do what you're able to do right now. But we'll get into that later on. I do these little previews. I'll give you a couple more, and I'm going to ask for some from you. So my little pumpkin, Deronimo, when he was two, from birth to two and on, whatever, we'd take him over to my parents, who lived close by. And he was beyond the twinkle in the eye of my dad. I mean, my dad, who was, whose life really was about science and kind of in the old way. He, was, he discovered life in the Dead Sea for his dissertation in, in marine microbiology. Isn't that cool? And he got the first dissertation. I look at him because he's from Israel. Um, he got the first PhD from the University of Jerusalem in microbiology. I mean, it's cool. It's cool. But anyway, so he's a very cerebral man. And he's like a rabbi of diatoms. He lived his life because was a, he, he studied silicone, and they were the basis. Point of all this is, all I got replaced with Dara, whom he loved more than life itself. So we used to take Duran there, and they went, about, well, it's about three. And all, we're there in the driveway, and just dropping them off. And suddenly, we hear this, Daddy. It was a neighbor. I had a motorcycle, big, loud, Harley tight motorcycle. Well, Duran started getting a little anxious. Started getting a lot anxious. It got to be a problem where he didn't want to go over to Saba's and Nana's. He was scared. It's like, oh my God, my little thrill has a phobia. And oh my God, he started getting nervous about going into town, into La Jolla for walks. Maybe there's going to be a motorcycle there. And oh my God, I've got a kid with a phobia. That's like, I'm a child psychologist. I can handle this. I can do this. Let's see. We tried all kinds of things. I got a little mini motorcycle. <laughs> there, was a, there happened to be a motorcycle in front of CG's, one of my wife's favorite stores, a lovely store in town. I happened to, the owner's sister was in my high school class. That's how small La Jolla is. Wonderful. Phyllis is wonderful. So there's a motorcycle there. So the guy's very friendly. So he puts Duran on the motorcycle. We're doing desensitization. <sighs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> None of it works. We're pulling into the driveway. It's the steepest driveway in La Jolla, actually. He used to skateboard down it, pretending it's Waimea Bay. We're at the top of the driveway. He's there. Oh, I want to go. I suddenly look at him, and I went. Bugga, bugga, chugga, choo. Motorcycle Protection Force is here to protect you. Whoosh. And he was like, saucer eyed and giggle. <laughs> Do it again. Bugga, bugga, chugga, choo. Motorcycle Protection Force is here to protect you. Whoosh. Go, do it around the car. Go do it around the car. <laughs> Went around the car, booga booga, chugga choo, motorcycle, but taking force here to pick you. Whoosh. He's all eyes. He's like, okay, now we're going to get on the driveway, do it all around the driveway. You have me do it all around the driveway, do it all around the inside of the house, do it all around the house. And then I did this one huge bolt of booga booga, chugga choo, motorcycle, but taking force. <laughs> For all of the way. <laughs> One trial cure. That was it. That was it. He was never scared of motorcycles ever again. I hope to God you're not riding a motorcycle now in Australia. <laughs> Actually, it's funny. It's amazing he didn't grow up to like, be a heavy biker guy. <laughs> but I guess because the issue was resolved. He didn't have to play it out later. But with the dynamics, type people would say, it's a different way of being in the world. By the way, real footnote. So when I was in St. George Holmes, I told you, Jungian-based place for teens. We had one guy who was 22, and he actually was a 
absolutely paranoid schizophrenic. I mean, he's amazing. You walk around Berkeley with him, and he'd say, do you see those cars? Do you look at their eyes and their grid? They're growling at me. I swear to you, I started going, they kind of do look like me. They're growling. Those days they had these grills. Anyway, well, he would stand by the doorway sometimes. And we'll say his name is Paul. Paul, what's the problem? I won't do it because this will be too loud. But basically, I'd stand right beside him. I'd say, don't worry, I'll take care of this. I'd open the door real fast and scream, get out of here, and close the door. And what would he do? Giggle. That is the healthiest part of him in that moment. The playful part of him that can giggle at how absurd it is that he thinks of somebody out there, and I just screamed. And sometimes they even pardon for the intrusion, so I'd even do, Paul, don't move. What, just don't move. Ha! Got it. And he'd laugh. Because his inner child can suddenly be triggered. Okay. Share, share, share. Some aspect, some part of childhood that was a little different. You have a thought you're willing to share? Uh, I had an imaginary friend, and I would always like give my mom a hard time, but not a little, kind of like what you did with the motorcycle. Mm -hmm. I like one time she tells me the story. His name was Pink Ghost. Pink ghost? Yeah, pink ghost. Like pink ghost. Pink ghost. Pink ghost. Okay. <laughs> and I, it went to the car wash. I started crying. So my mom, like, before it, like, enters the car wash, like, she stopped it. Like, she pretended to, like, unbuckle the bell. And, like, she was like, okay, I got him. And she was like, pink ghost, don't ever do that again. And, like, Beautiful. so, you know, obviously to me, in that mindset is so real that, like, my mom, I think it's so sweet that when parents do that for their kids. Absolutely. Friends of mine, their daughter was absolutely certain. I mean, it wasn't, it's, it's, an, it's a truth to her. It's not a, that wasn't even a question. That there were, there were gnomes. You laugh. <laughs> there were gnomes, like I was saying. She knew there were gnomes in her backyard. It was in Berkeley, a perfect place for gnomes. And so she built, or her dad very wonderfully built a little gnome home. Absolutely, a little gnome home. It's amazing how many gnomes can fit in a thing that's about this big. <laughs> oh, hundreds. And she had names for all the gnomes and whatnot. And of course, they'd be fed every breakfast. They'd get a little breakfast thing. And they get a little, she couldn't do lunch because she wasn't there. But she knew gnomes didn't have to eat lunch. But they need breakfast and dinner. Little known facts about gnomes. In fact, she could write a book, little known facts about gnomes. I like the sound of that. <laughs> and she, and, and, and of course, the proof was that when she'd get home from school, the food was all gone. And of course, when she'd wake up in the morning, the dinner was all gone. You'd never seen so many fat cats in that neighborhood. <laughs> Holly's like, let's go over the gnome home. We're going to score some food, man. What do you got tonight? Oh, man, lasagna. We've got to love this. <laughs> yeah, she believed. I mean, it's true. True for her. You all actually believed in Santa. Until your prefrontal cortex starts kicking in, and you go, wait a minute. 24 hours. 25,000 miles circumference. What's the population now? About 8 billion? That's a lot of chimneys. Oh, wait a minute. Not all houses, houses have chimneys. I mean, you, you're, that's all prefrontal cortex, right? And you kind of went, holy schmoly. He doesn't exist. Do I tell my brother? <laughs> because he still believes. Tooth fairy. You believed. You absolutely believed. When I was uh, now at nine, Clay Clayworth and I, my best friend in Berkeley, we really believed we had x-ray vision. And we were the good guys, and we were going to go patrol Berkeley. And in those days, it was safe enough to walk around the streets at nine, just down the street from you. you never do that. Now. You got your cell phones. And anyway. And we would look in through walls to see if any crime was going on. <laughs> no, listen, and I really believed. I'd look and I'd go, Oh, wow, can you see, you see the orange couch? Yeah, wow, weird couch. And do you, wow, look at that. And I never knocked on the door to find out if there actually was an orange couch. <laughs> when did that been cool? How'd you know there was an orange couch? It works! I found a treasure map for treasure in Africa. Again, I'm about eight. Nine. And I built this raft 
In those days, I keep saying that, the supermarkets had their um, stuff come in actual wood boxes. So they would let me have the wood box. I tore the wood apart. And I made a raft about this, twice the size of this. And I told my parents. So on Saturday, I'm heading to Africa. I need you to take this raft. I believed. I need you to take this raft, put it on top of the car. I want you to drive me down to the bay. And I'll be back in about six months. <laughs> Can you make brownies, please, Mom? Because I want a lot of brownies. And he'll say they did not take me down to the bay. <laughs> Five six zero two one nine one. That's called child abuse or child neglect in this regard. Different mindset, different way of being in the world, and you gotta honor that. You gotta move into that space because that's what's real for them. Not only the prefrontal cortex is near the dorsal. You know about the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex? That's that's why when you take some alcohol or other stuff. You're now dancing on the table in front of a thousand people. Because <laughs> your dorsal lateral is a little offline. Social judgment, consequence, all that stuff. So they don't have near as much as that. It's not myelinated yet, like in the same way. So they believe. And it also allows in certain ways, because by the way, when you're sleeping in dream states, those areas go offline. So you can look at the world in different ways. One of the Let me tell you something about the brain. From day one, I should tell you this. The main function of the brain is to predict. To predict. That's the reason you can sit in that chair. Because you predicted. Well, I'm gonna pre I, my mind right now is predicting exactly where this table is going to be. I don't even know that it does that. If this table was a quarter inch lower, I would have gone, whoa. So we have all these predictive schemas. We'll talk about that later. And that's wonderful, but it also rigidifies our thinking. So it's hard to think outside the box, as they say, and come up with a whole different solution. Later on in the class, I'll show you that's the nine dot problem. And because of these schemas you've learned, you'll have a very hard time solving it. A kid wouldn't necessarily, because they don't have the same schemas. Kids have an easier time with you not than adults, because they don't have as rigid a schema about weird names. All names got kind of weird to them in a way. They have less, they have more flexibility about that. You're an adult, you what? You're who? You're what? It's so fun, okay? Somebody else tell us a little bit about childhood that was different for them, and then we'll start moving. Please. Um, <clears throat> when I was with, in the, when my dad was married to my second stepmother, he, my grandmother lived in California, and they still lived <clears throat> in the Midwest, and my grandmother uh, knew that I was having a difficult time, so she would write letters from a mouse named Molly Magnolia Mouse, who was going through the same troubles in her little mouse family. And she would like sign it with little paw prints. And I didn't know it was from my grandma until I was older, but it helped. No, that's beautiful. Just speaking of that, like, actually a client of mine, and I, I asked permission to share this. Said, yeah, 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 you can even tell my name, because he's real proud. <laughs> I won't tell them your name. It just wouldn't feel right. I want you to. I know, but I just won't. Sorry. It just violates too many things within me. So he's a teacher. And he sees, uh, teaches, I think they're fourth graders. So what are they? They're 10-ish. And he very, he's, a, he has, he's very in touch with his inner child. He's a wonderful guy. I've seen him for many years, off and on. So he got one of those. Um, I forgot what you call them. They're, they're kind of like a Nerf ball, but they're like spiky, but it's all rubber. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're called. What are they? Cush ball. Cush ball. That's exactly it. It's a cush ball. He got a cush ball. Brought it in the class. Said, hi, this is Bob. I found him on a distant shore. He is going to be our teacher's aide for the year. These kids love Bob. If a kid needs help on a question, Bob's going to come and help you. I'll help Bob help you. Bob's going to be right here. Who needs Bob today feeling a little anxious? They love Bob. They, you know, they earn points. They will spend points to be able to have Bob with them. Somebody's having you know, a rough day to get Bob. They have a hard time on the test, on the test or whatever. Put Bob with them. One of the kids beg. They're going for the summer. What happens to Bob in the summer? Kind of hangs here, but there's no kids. I'm going to go to Europe. Can I please take Bob? I'll take really good care of him. Absolutely. 
So Bob went all over Europe. <laughs> Many, true. And then she would send, or email, or whatever. Um, all right, I'll say your name, because he would want me to. He's like, yeah, yeah, Jeff. He would send Jeff. He's happy, I can see. <laughs> tell him the last name. I'm not going to tell him the last name. But you don't see Jeff. Um, text and emails which, with pictures of Bob under the Eiffel Tower, <laughs> um, Buckingham Palace, and a gondola. It's, yeah, it's like, where's Bob? It's real. And if you can tap in, look at your faces. If you can see your faces, it's fabulous. If you can tap into that energy, we will cure cancer and we will find peace in the Middle East. If you can tap into that energy, it's unbelievable. But it's all right there. That's the good news. It is, and you don't even have to get underneath the table with a blanket. It is there. Whether you remember it or not, that way of being is there. And one of the joys and luxuries and privileges of being a play therapist. I gotta tell you something, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. This is so cool. It's so cool to be in that space with a kid. And it is so healing for all of us to be in that space. Okay. Let's see, I'm give you oh, we only got a couple three minutes, and I'm gonna take a break, then we're gonna come back and go into parenting. Any questions? Prefrontal or otherwise? I know, it's kind of silly. Yeah, okay, we're good, we're getting that sense. Let's see if I want to give you any other off the top example. No, we're going to take a break. Okay, we are back, people. Thank you for being back right up, in fact, early. Okay, so back early. A um, couple other just, uh oh, oh, we're almost back. We're almost back. We're getting there. We're, we're back. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, Again, for those new to the class, just remember this. I have a best friend I've known since age 10. His birthday is on November 3rd. It'll become relevant about 10 weeks from now. Thank you. This little, this little pumpkin I saw, again, different ways to look at things. And he was, he was describing another kid, and he said, kid's so bad. He went to heaven and he stole the halos off of angels. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, would you come? That's just such a fantastic image and just like, oh my God, the concept. Rare the adult that would ever even think of such a concept. I mean, just like, oh, it's so bad he, go, he went to heaven and stole the halos off of angels. Oh my God, that's bad. And another one in a very poignant way. Uh, his brother uh, had a, it was a hit and run. His brother died. So his mom, I have seen him with that. And his mom said, you know, we were, we were looking at the sunset. And he suddenly said, look, mom, Michael is helping Jesus paint the sky. Oh. Yeah, it's very real. Fun. Okay. So now that we've evoked childhood, Let's talk about parenting. I spend, we're going to spend two sessions at least on parenting because it's important. We have some data. If you're going to work with kids, you're going to work with parents, you need to have some information about caregiving. Furthermore, the things we're going to be talking about in terms of caregiving fit absolutely, if not amplifiedly, in therapy. That's all relevant. One way to look at parenting is, it has nothing to do with kids. It has all to do with what kind of 30-year-old you hope your little pumpkin grows up to be. You have three kids? I can't remember. Two. 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 It's like, no, not three. Two. Two is plenty. Hey, look at those hands. And you have, if I remember. One 20-month-old. One 20-month-old. And you were... My wife is eight months pregnant. That's it. Expecting. Um, is it okay to have your name, your sure. kid's name? Alan. Alan? All right, so let's imagine this, okay? Alan's, he's 30 years old. His three, I know, isn't that amazing? To <laughs> you should have seen her face. She was like, whoa, kid's 20. He's like, whoa. There's Alan, he's 30. So cool, it is cool. And he's teary eyed. I don't even know Alan. So let's imagine his three best friends are right out here. Come on in. 
Can't you almost imagine that they're out there and they're coming in? See, your magic child is just that. Man, it's just right. Come on in, come on in, come on in. What do you hope? When we say, hey, describe Alan for us. Tell us his traits, his, his Rorschach protocol, his MMPI <laughs> profile. <laughs> Whatever. Whether they use it then or not. Um, anyway, what, what traits, attributes, qualities would you wish, at least one or two or three of them, would you wish that they would say in describing Alan? Youthful? He's youthful. Yay! Full of youth. Um, selfless. Selfless. Has a huge heart. Ah. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Same question with your little pumpkin who's eight months, so his amygdala is already four, or her, actually. Do you know if it's he or she? Um, his. His. Kind. Oh, he's kind. Affectionate. Affectionate. Gay. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 That's a happy face, in case you don't recognize it. Okay, in either or both senses or whatever. Okay, other adjectives for your kids. Um, your two, what do you hope they get at 30? Those things, um, honest. That they're honest. <laughs> to self and others, yeah. That's cool. The honest one self is really hard. Um, Sometimes. That they have a goal of like a Ah, hunger for knowledge, chomp, chomp. <laughs> wow. If we can make, okay. Please. Oh, congratulations, that's awesome. Boy, girl. Boy, okay, so please, what would you... Wish sense of humor. Sense of humor. Secure, secure. Um, uh, secure. Yes, please. Responsible. He's responsible. Love for her, her, for her what? For her neighbor, for her fellow human. Okay. Very social. Loves people. Loves people. Exactly. <coughs> I'm sorry. Do you actually have a child? Or? Oh, cool. She's how old? Um, yeah, 22. Oh. Oh, I was gonna say you're really <laughs> you were 13 when you had her, or younger than that. No, 22 months. Oh, we got all these. This is so cool. This is perfect. Okay. Others, even those who don't have kids, you have, you have pets. <laughs> Open-minded. Very good. No, the ways you want your pets to be. Actually, the nice thing about pets, we'll talk a lot about pets. They already are the way you want them to be most of the time. Open-minded. That's why I love them so much. Self-aware. Independent. Self-aware, independent. Yeah, they're not living off of you at 30. <laughs> In fact, right. Inde integrity. Oh, wow, integrity. They have integrity. Being able to find happiness. Cool. Able to find It's here somewhere. There it is. Passionate. Passionate. Okay, passionate. Ambitious. What? You gotta love your mother. Ambitious. <laughs> love mom. You got this big tat on their arm. <laughs> mom. Your heart in both arms. Mama. Mama. Pride in who they are and where they come from. Whoa. Wow. Okay. Pride. Who they are. Where they come from. 
Okay. Confident. Somebody else had a hand up. I saw back there. Some. Or they did speak. Yeah. Okay. Confident. Appreciative of life. Oh yeah. Joie de vivre. Give back to the world. Yeah. Give back. Social consciousness. Yeah. Okay. Called social and nature conscious. Ah. Lollipop of existence. Ability to self and affect regulation. <laughs> that term. Oh, God, yes. Healthy. You mean just physical health? Yeah. yeah. So you guys are young. So you put the, your back goes out one time, just one time, especially if it's a really good south swell and you can't go surfing. All you care about is health. Never mind the big stuff, cancer, and these huge things people deal with. Huge things people deal with. For God's sakes, have health. Because when you don't, that's all that matters almost. So that's a good one. We left anything out? Oh, come on! What's one from the Wizards of Oz? You gotta have courage! <laughs> you gotta have courage! Right? Courage! Oh, that's also gotta have a heart. Right, we'll put the courage down here. Was the Tin Man one? Yeah, and brain smart, smart. We, you know, let's just follow the Wizard of Oz. She kind of covered it. That's right. Yeah, that's true, actually. Let's have some intelligence. That is funny. So wait, wait, wait. That's right. So when wisdom. Whoa, man. Now we're really getting cosmic here. Wisdom. Yeah. Again, that's the joie de vivre. At least that's why I look at it. But excited. Appreciate life. Excited about it. Excited about it. I got to tell you, I got a picture from Duran. Every parent would both want and not. Actually, what I got is a Vox. I don't know if you know about Voxer. It's kind of like you leave a message. I thought it was actually you get to talk. It's like a walkie-talkie. How are you doing? You out there? And then finally get this, Dad, it's not a walkie-talkie. You just leave the message. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Anyway, so I get this message. He's, he's out there traveling. He was in New Zealand. This was two days, three days ago. Do I have the picture? <laughs> he's out there traveling in New Zealand with Kyla, this friend of his. With him. So Kyla says, okay, so Duran is, um, he's taken off. Uh, okay, I'll let you know. I'm like, what, what do you mean taking off? <laughs> well, he's, in, he's, a late. He's, uh, he's taking the highest skydiving experience in New Zealand. So he's on his way to 18,000 feet. And then he's going to jump out. I'm going to tell you what happens. <laughs> like, just tell me, they didn't tell me he landed on the ground for like hours later. And I know even at 18,000 feet, it doesn't take hours to land. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah, pull the one. I mean, come on. So the picture, of course, of course, there are these two pictures. One's like, and the other's from afar. And into, oh my God. As I said, he did not get that gene from me. But that is an excitement about life. It's like, yeah, go for it, man. Awesome. As I'll say, thrill sensibly. And he obviously didn't parachute alone. Obviously, there's the pro on his back. And I love how they have these little helmets. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's that's real. That's going to save your ass. Way again, way before your time. Believe it or not, in elementary schools, we actually used to have drills where you get underneath the desk in case there's an atom bomb attack. Like getting underneath the desk and doing this is going to help. The atom bomb attack. Well, I kind of had that association with that little helmet. Anyway, yes, an excitement and appreciation for life, but courage. Courage was the lion, right? He wanted to have courage. Tin Man wanted to have the brain. No, the heart. Oh, heart. Tin Man wanted to have the heart. That's right. Right, that's right. Right, better joints. That's good. Wait, and who... Scarecrow. Scarecrow wanted to have the brains because he had, yeah, right, of course. This is cool. All right, we're leaving anything out. What we got here? We got youthful, got those healthy, selfless, big heart. Cool. 
Creative, there's one. That's a really good one. Create if. Ah! Some, okay, some sense of the greater, or however you want to call it, spiritual. Okay. I mean, obviously, toilet trained and all that other basic. <laughs> now I gets a laugh. It's silly. <laughs> Had 31 would hope. <laughs> Otherwise, didn't quite. It was a little over permissive on that diaper. <laughs> right. I think we've covered a lot of stuff. Financially sound. Ha ha. Again, not living off of you and can take care of you in your old age. Actually, let me do this one. Um, you know, you know Seligman, right? Father of Positive Psychology, Optimistic Child, really nice book, actually, the Optimistic Child. It's on your list somewhere in there. Not as a have to read, but as a go other good reads. No, no real have to, I'm installing. Um, so he, there was some, I can't remember the guy's name, fancy private school, East Coast, and a lot of their graduates went to Harvard, Yale, and all that other stuff. And then they started looking at how those young people then did further in life. And they started wondering what traits, qualities, attributes, characteristics, etc., predicted contentment, happiness in life kind of thing. And of course, they found it was not in all really correlated to grade point average. So this guy got together with Selman, and they did some research and whatnot. And they came up with seven traits, qualities, attributes, characteristics, whatever, that predicted in these kids now adults, happiness, contentment, satisfaction, and whatnot. So let's see if I can remember them. Come on, hippocampus, here we go. One, which you got here, curiosity. I'm sorry, so the traits what? The predicted contentment and happiness as an adult. One was certainly curiosity. Uh, a attitude of gratitude. By the way, footnote, I don't know if any of you take omega-3s. It's really important to take omega-3s. They're really good for you. I'm not, I should do this claim, I'm not a dietitian, I'm not an MD, blah, 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 blah. Omega-3s, among other things. Vitamin D3, blah, blah. Omega-3 for the soul. Before your sweet head, head rests on that pillow. Never mind you had your 60 minutes of pure unadulterated fun. You say, you say, whisper out loud, or at least clearly in your mind, every day, three things that you are grateful for. Unbelievable. There's all kinds of research about all the good things that happen. And again, correlation studies, as we all know, all you little research statistician people know correlation does not mean causation. Water and bourbon gets you drunk. Water and whiskey gets you drunk. Water and wine gets you drunk. Therefore, water gets you drunk. No. I actually remember that from my stat class in undergraduate UC Santa Barbara. Correlation does not mean causation. But nonetheless, you say three things you are grateful for. So attitude of gratitude, being curious, having grit, which is tenacity, under stress, under, under some you know, strain, tenacity, stick with it, have grit. The old, what is it, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, stick with it. I'll say that one a lot. You stuck to it till you do it. <sighs> Duh, self-control. Affect regulation and otherwise. Be in charge of hands, feet, mind, and mood. Have self Control. Four. Have some social savviness. Be aware of others, some social skills. Optimism. The sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun. All right, little orphan Annie. Got to be optimistic. One, two, three, four, five, six. I did it. And the last one, zest. Have a zest for life. You listed a lot of them. Put your listing. So the question becomes, of course, 
What caregiver? Behaviors, qualities, traits, attributes, ways of being. Oh, wait. Social consciousness kicking in. Take care of the planet. Ah, mother of the side a little. Thank you. The good news is, I mean, we've described kind of like the perfect human being that nobody is. <laughs> we built the perfect human being. And they accept their imperfection, of course. Or they're modest about the perfectness that they are. You're right. The good news is you as a caregiver, if this is what you said, actually, no, do not have to do all these things. Otherwise, you're going to not be optimistic about how your little pumpkins are all going to turn out. Say, oh, God, let's give up now. And I can't be all these things. Though, actually, technically speaking, if you really observe a little pumpkin or yourself, at any given moment in time, over across a broad range of time, you will see that everybody in this room has exhibited every one of those traits. Everybody in this room has exhibited every one of those traits at some point. And every little pumpkin by age three has exhibited every one of those traits at some point. That's the good news. So if you've read any part of Skull I Get, and it's OK, I hope you do, because it's a really cool book, you will see that that philosophy, his and that whole approach, believes it's not a matter of evoking, it's a matter of maintaining. That's already there. You know who's brilliant at that? Is good old Milton Erickson. You guys, anybody familiar with Milton Erickson? It's okay if you're not. Before you get your license, you're gonna read Uncommon Therapy. You're gonna just open the book by Jay Haley called Uncommon Therapy. At any random page, and you're gonna read a couple of pages. You don't have to read the whole book. He followed Milton Erickson and wrote about it. Milton Erickson is, is a icon, is a, he's a whole movement. Love the color purple, by the way. Love your, sh your sweater. And he's a hypnotherapist. He was a psychiatrist hypnotherapist. And he understood that when you were 12, 14 months, whatever it was, and you let go of that table edge. I remember that I gave you this last time. And you had that feeling of, oh my God, oh my God but that's still there, and how to tap into that field. And he was brilliant at tapping into that field. So the good news is, you've already done all these things. So a parent's job in many ways is to help maintain, sustain, enhance all that. So, but what approaches, what attitudes, what ways of being as a parent might relate to our kids growing up at 30 to being these marvelously well-maintained human beings? But do you mean like, and what actually like the spiritual attitude that they're respecting the individual? Or behavior is a ways of being. So one, one is to be respect, did you say respecting the individual? Okay, so that would be one parenting attitude, approach, belief, way of being, being respectful. Are you talking about the, like, the parenting approach is like authoritative versus like authoritarian? We're exactly going to get to that. We're exactly going to go to bomb ride in a matter of moments. After we list some things, I'm going to talk about Baum Wright. Even though she did her research way back when, nobody's done a better piece in terms of that, ironically. Good listening skills. Okay. And then we're going to go another way about it. Flexibility. Ah, very good. Never heard that one. 20 plus years, 30, whatever it is, teaching this class. Yeah, 30. <laughs> Never heard diplomatic. What do you mean by that? Um, I mean, I think I know what you mean, but what do you mean? Kind of going to welcome any suggestions or anything that might be helpful in kind of oh. flexible. And so it's a flexible, it's also being open, it sounds like. Yeah. But, Okay. You have to be a 
keeping what? Warm. Warm. You betcha. Teach manners. Interesting. Okay. Something mobility. Availability. Availability. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Availability, being available. Say again? Being strength based, seeing strength. Ah, strength based. Strength based. It's about letting them make choices within reason, so it's like trusting them. Creating a safe environment. Attentive. Sorry? Attentive. Very good. Attentive. Oh, sorry. You, you, taught, you taught parenting class. Right. See, this is okay. Letting go of your expectations. Okay. Seeing that, like that. That's another way to put it. Seeing them for who they are. Let me make up a vignette to show you another quality that you all would want to do as a parent. Consistent. Oh, okay. Consistent. Okay, here comes a vignette two. Vignette A. I want to thank the Nobel Committee. Um, <laughs> apparently, uh, I'm the year 22. I'm apparently the youngest person to ever get the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, it's beyond an honor, obviously. Um, apparently, the webcams are all out and whatnot. So I'm, I'm thinking my parents are probably uh, watching. So I would like to say this to them. I told you. <laughs> never. You never want to have that ever happen. Instead, let's do a replay. <laughs> which you can edit out the, yeah, yeah, you know how to, blur. Um, wow, what an honor. Unbelievable. Nobel Committee, Nobel Prize, the 22 for peace. But, uh, um, let me say what is, uh, webcams and all that, great, I, I sure hope my parents are watching. Because let me say uh, the, the, the cliche, but it's the truth from my heart. I want to thank them for believing in me when I didn't believe in myself. Thanks, thanks. This is for them. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's what you want to hear. That's what you want to hear. They believed in me, in my spirit, my core of who I was, even when I absolutely didn't believe in myself. Believe in their spirit, whatever you want to call it, their abilities, who they really are, even when they don't believe in themselves. You want to give that to your kids. Everyone. Yeah? Interesting research was done somewhere that says even under adverse circumstances, one person in the life of a child who's a strong supporter can make a huge difference in their potential for success. Even if it isn't uh, a parent. Uh, on the nose. And we're going to get to that. And that could be the placard, placard, plaque, above all play therapist's office. Even one person, one person who really sees this child, and we'll get to all of that, can make a profound difference in the child's life. Said it very well. And, you're, and we'll talk about we'll talk about a lot of that. But yes, well said. Okay, so let's get to Baum, right? Smart lady, way back. I think I can't remember if it's UC Berkeley somewhere. I think. See what? Baum, right? Baum, right? And she basically did the following piece of research way back when. She looked at kids who were doing very well using, of course. 
teacher ratings and whatnot. By the way, you ever do a custody eval, you gotta talk to the teacher. Teachers know these kids. They spend, what is it, nine months out of the year basically, five hours a day, they know kids. And looked at kids who seem to be, if, you, if we break up the traits we did, it's about being self-confident, self-loving, self-aware, self-appreciating. It's about being socially savvy in ways. It's about being masterful and competent and kind of enjoying that. Anyway, so she took the kids that were kind of two SDs over to the right of the norm in terms of positive traits, attributes, being kind, all that stuff. Went back and looked at the parenting. Traits, qualities, attributes, interviews, observations, all that stuff. Came up with some factors. Yeah, oh, there's an old stat word I haven't used in a long time. Factors. Then smart lady does the opposite. Gets a bunch of parents and whatnot, looks at parents who are particularly strong in these particular factors, and goes back and looks at the kids. And sure enough, correlation does not mean causation, but nonetheless, high correlation between kids who are competent, self confident all that stuff, and being parented this way. Factors being, of course, some variation of being warm, having warmth. Ah, yes, what's that term? Love, and expressing the love for the child in a way that the child feels it, experiences it. Let me tell you right now what I call the tight phenomenon. You gotta have this for every kid you see, at least in a moment. Never mind for your own children and any children you're being with. Tight means a twinkle in the eye. You gotta have a twinkle in the eye for the kids you see. At some moment, I don't mean all the time, Google God, aren't you cute? Some moment, like, awesome, because they will know it. They will know it if you have it, and they will really know it if you don't. <laughs> they will know it. It's all in the, because it's horrible frontal lobe. Let me say just a little more about that. You know what prosody? Prosody is the way of, of communication, not, it's the form and not the content in a way. Let me give you an example. And again, I, please, 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 I'm not in any way trying to disparage any language, any anything, okay? This is just kind of to highlight the concept of prosody. Okay. Do you get the different affects in there? That's what matters. It was just gibberish. It's gibberish. Unless I'm doing tongues and you find out it's some Aramaic language from the early, you know, 300 BC. But it's all in the tone, it's in the facial expressions, it's in the pheromones, and it is in the eyes. Oh, so much in the eyes. I sometimes <laughs> Really, and he gets in there and he's doing this crazy stuff. He was like, huh. But you get the tone of it. You get when you're arguing, and you're like, That's how kids experience us so much. We do all these words at them, all that prefrontal cortex words, and all they listen to the honey, I'm like, no, 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 your wonderful, loving, caring dad is on the phone for you. <laughs> I, never say, I, I only say positive things. <laughs> See the transcript. Swear to God. Oh, okay. I'm sure that has nothing to do with contaminant. Kids always, 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 I tell this to every parent. Kid knows exactly how you feel about the other parent. One of the little tests, or tasks I call it, because it's not a test. I give kids, sorry for being a little tangential, relatively, relevantly tangential. <laughs> Minus 10, plus, uh, plus 10, zero. How's, the, how's your mom feel about your dad? Put an X on the line. How's your dad feel about your mom? Put an X on the line. <laughs> <laughs> 
I never say anything bottom up. Anyway, bottom right, back to bottom right. Warm, obviously. Love, when I twinkle in the eye. Footnote, that twinkle is unconditional. We all want to be loved, cherished, adored unconditionally, not because we got the A, not because we got the gold medal. And not that those things are bad. I and mean, we will talk a lot about why, why there's a whole bunch of things, why I, our dopamine goes up when we do that. And that got us out of the trees. It's wonderful. Confidence, mastery, it's wonderful. Okay. Okay, obviously, explicated limits. Yes, of course, like you said, structure, there's limits, there's boundaries. Let me give you a five second pantomime of effect effective limit setting from birth on. Ready? That's probably three seconds, actually. If I could, I'd be applauding all the way as I'm doing this. Applause, 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 applause. That's how limits ought to be for kids. Because number three, and it's explained. So you never would say, Mommy, why can't I? Why? Because I said so, or I told you so. Por qué? Por qué? Amazing to me. It's Spanish. Who speaks Spanish here? He looks bad. It's amazing to me that the same word for why is because. That's brilliant. Why? Because. What else do you need to know? Por qué? Por qué? Oh, okay. Hasta la vista. Um, you explain the limits, and we'll get into all the reasons why. And, and this is the this part. You foster, hey, we'll do it in blue. That's cool. That surprised me. See, my brain was predicting it was going to be black. It already knew that. And all of a sudden, it freaked out because it was blue. And I didn't even know I was predicting it was going to be black. Fostering autonomy within the limits set. Actually, let me say something else in good parenting. Not only, and actually, I don't think Baumreich said this, but it's so clear to me. Are we on time? We're okay. It's so clear to me. It's not only that there are explicated limits. I'm going to use a really powerful, very primal word. Do you know what that is? It's okay if you don't. They've got to be fair. It's got to be fair. It's got to be fair. And I know you're thinking, but life isn't fair. Don't say that to your kid. <laughs> but as well learn early. Life isn't fair. Right now, I don't know if they're on break over there, or, you know, uh, recess over there at Thurman. If they are, they're at recess right now, even in the classroom right now. I promise you, there's at least 158 kids either thinking or saying, that's not fair! That's not fair! That's not fair! That's not fair! And when they get to be around age 8, 9, 10, oh my God, not fair! <laughs> oh my God, the affect around the concept of fairness, because developmentally now, people, of course, they have a whole other level of that. Early on, it's different. Now, it is so ingrained in our species. By the way, it comes out of the amygdala. When you're born, it's like, hey, 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 hey. at some very, very primitive, primal level, and in some way, it's like, that's not fair, that is fair. Some of those research, again, there was a wonderful video, but there's some other research where kids, infants, look longer at something that's not fair than is fair. They know it really early on. You ever seen the, oh God, there's, in fact, I'll send you the URL on one of the primate ones. There are two primate studies I know that involve fairness. They're fantastic. One is what I call the monkeys and bananas. Not a joke, here you go. Monkey A, researcher, monkey. Monkey does some task. Researcher hands him a banana, ooh, ah, ah. Sits in the cage eating a banana. Monkey B comes, does task, hands banana. Monkey A, monkey B sitting there in their cages eating bananas. You know exactly what's coming. Monkey 3 comes up, handed a banana without any task. Monkey A, monkey B go, pardon me, ape shit. <laughs> they go ape shit. They do. They're like, ah, 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 not fair. 
fair. We worked, he did not fair. <laughs> Finally made level. Here's another one. Great. This is on this. I, I don't have the URL for the person. I do for this one. It's unbelievable. Monkey A, monkey B <laughs> are in these uh, plastic cages next to each other, and they're eating their cucumbers. They're given cucumbers by the researcher that's in the lab coat, doing the cucumber thing. And suddenly, one monkey is suddenly being given grapes, a preferred food, by the researcher for no reason. Suddenly, monkey A gets it. What is it? Oh my God, I'll share the URL. Monkey B is taking the cucumbers, going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Furious. It's not fair. What are you giving them? I don't get any. And monkey A bunch is like, okay, cool it. Don't give me more grapes, man. It's freaking them out. <laughs> Swear to God. But I wish they had done. I wish they'd put a little thing between A and B, because I bet A would have given B some grapes, saying, it's okay, man, we can do this. Because that's fair. So don't forget that primal, primal sense. So I always call it the inner principled one. It's really strong in all of us, some even more than others. So when a kid when a kid says to you, that's not fair, what's the first thing you need to say back besides, or instead of, life's not fair, learn it early, kid? What should you say? It's not fair, Mom. It's not fair. So what would be fair? Okay, I mean, that, that's, I mean, I like that engaging the child with what they think would be fair. First, the, the first thing, being empathic, what would be the first thing you respond? It's not fair. I know. I know, and it sucks. It sucks. It feels terrible when something's unfair. I hate it when something's unfair. I totally get it. By the way, at least 99.3% of the time, totally made up statistic. <laughs> I'll cop to that. Pen will drop. I lied. I don't know. But I would guess 99.3% of the time when a kid says it's not fair, he's right or she's right. It isn't fair. It's a happenstance in the universe that I was born before you were, and I'm given the incredible honor and privilege and beyond that of being your dad. So I have more power than you. I do, to make this decision that we're going to do this now. It's just a random act of the universe. I came first. Sorry. So it feels unbelievably unfair to you. I totally get it. I totally get it. And you got to really mean that. Fairmonely, you got to mean I totally get it. And don't say, hey, listen, I'm a parent, okay? I have more wisdom. When you get to be my age, you will under, fuck you. <laughs> what? Don't, don't give me that. It's just discounting me. I stand as a little stupid neophyte, so I don't know yet. I was thinking, how would I feel if that was being said to me? Or when that was said to me? How did I feel? Don't tell me that. When you get older. Ah! I know that doesn't feel fair. So fairness is very, very, very important. And part of that is that you foster autonomy every chance you get. There's a wonderful scene in a not well-known movie called, I think it's called The Horse Whisperer, Robert Redford. Let me see it. So, girl's a horse rider, she and a friend are riding, there's an accident, the friend dies, she becomes phobic of the horse, uh, horse riding, but she has a passion. Her mom, and it, of course, pervades her life. Her mom brings her to Redford, who's this kind of stoic ranch guy, horse guy, and he works with her. And there's a wonderful scene, and she's he has an anxiety disorder, trauma, post-traumatic stress. They're on a country road. <laughs> she has no faith in herself. <laughs> They're driving. Of course, a Chevy truck or something. Can't remember if I had the gun rack. <laughs> it's an old scene. <laughs> he said, boy, he says, you're going to drive. She's like, what? So you're going to drive. Here. And he just switches and puts her in. And then she's terrified. She says, you're fine. You're going to do this. You're going to be fine. I just take a little nap. <laughs> he says, he puts his cowboy hat. And she starts to drive. Well, that's not only fostering autonomy, it's also saying I believe in you, way beyond you believe in yourself. I know you're competent. Well, so let's be clear. It's a country road. There's nobody around, nothing around. It's dirt. There's no danger. You foster autonomy. We want that like crazy. In fact, in fact, let's even push it a little farther. Probably, perhaps, the strongest, one of the, not the, one of the strongest motives in all human functioning is the F word. Freedom! Freedom! 
I have been to the mountain. Every time I hear that speech, ah, oh, just tears. Give me free. Give me liberty or give me death. This whole country was founded on the concept of freedom. What's freedom? Choice. What's autonomy? Choice. So we got fairness as primate. We've got choice, freedom, sense of freedom as the most, one of the most primal drives in all human functioning. I regret I only have one life to give for my country, and this country is about freedom of choice. Autonomy. It's huge. These are huge issues we're dealing with in a little thing called parenting. Warmth. You set fair limits. There's, you foster autonomy, choice, freedom within those limits. And you get to share yourself, your thoughts, your feelings, who you are. Parents who share who they are. Share self. Duran knows I took acid one time. It stopped me using basically any other substance, period, after that. I was 19, 18, 19, took acid, and the picture frame of reality went, Nip! holy shit, pardon me, I just want it back, give it back. I didn't have some weird, you know, oh, well, I'm seeing the colors of the sounds, I didn't have anything like that. It was awful. It was just a four and a half hour anxiety, panic attack. It was terrible. I'm in a friend's house, right? I wasn't a big dope or anything, but I mean, these are the 60s for God's sake, 68, 69, everybody's, you know, okay, I'll try it. And all of a sudden, I'm like, Whoa. I'm staying the night. I run into his parents' bedroom. They knew me since I was a little kid. I said, I'm on acid. i got to come down. They're like, ah! oh my god. I'm like, yeah, yeah, i got to come down. Call my mom. Call my dad right now. Yeah, OK, we're going to anyway. Good. <laughs> I want my mommy. Oh, yeah, freaked. What an existential lesson. My dear mom, very close to comes to the door, I open the door. There's mom. She holds me. Shit, I don't feel any different. Oh my God, I'm a separate human being. Oh no! Oh my God! What do you mean no man's an island? We're all islands! I'm alone. I'm totally alone in life. Holy shit, no matter how close you are to somebody, you're still separate in that way? Oh my God! Now I'm really freaked. Existential angst. Oh yeah. But I had hope. I figured by five in the morning, for some reason, I thought, five in the morning, this will wear off, I'll be fine. I'll have my life cereal, it's going to be fine. <laughs> it's going to be fine. I ate, a, I ate a case of life cereal a month. I had a box a day. We'd go buy it by the case. I loved life cereal. I even wrote to them, please don't ever stop making life cereal. And they write back saying, have you ever tried other brands? I'm like, what? <laughs> I realized two things. One is, when I think thought about five in the morning. In that moment, I was calm. So then I had two islands in this storm. One is thinking about five in the morning and I'm going to be fine. And the other is thinking about how when I think about five in the morning, I'm fine. And whenever I did that, I'd be fine. And then <gasps> I had my little dog, Cushy, went home. I had Cushy, I had my bowl of life cereal really early. It was about two in the morning. By about four in the morning, I was fine, actually. Six months later, I started having flashbacks. Oh my God. Oh my God. And then I started learning. It lasts about three minutes and it goes away. The last time I had a flashback was 1979, UC Davis, when I was doing an internship. I was watching the news with my roommate, and suddenly the TV went 2D. And I was like, oh my God, it's one of those flashbacks. I haven't had this in years. It'll go away. Went away. Gone. The point is, I share, Duran knows all about me. Now, I'm not oversharing unbound. He knows stuff. Because and he, share, I, he knows how I feel about what he does. You get to share. It's a human relationship. This is real, human to human. Never mind, I'm going to treat you with respect. By the way, I'm going to request you treat me with respect. At least I'm going to let you know when I feel you're not. So the good news, if you want to say about breaking up the hierarchy into humanness, humanity, is it gets to be real on both ends. It's real. It's real. 
and they love you for it. My God. Thoughts, feelings, fantasies, reactions, as you hear all this spiel on the bomb right thing, though it's a takeoff, this isn't exactly what she says, but it's the basic idea. Because you're right, she then goes into authoritarian versus authoritative versus permissive parenting, these different styles and the repercussions. What I'm describing is authoritative parenting, kind of a balance. Just so you know, I mean, if you look at Bam, you can, look, you know, but I'm, I mean, that's all good, but I'm more interested in the aspects of it than necessarily these bigger models. When I do a custody battle, I do want to know kind of where they lie in the parameters between authoritative, authoritarian, permissive, which is really submissive. So I want to know where they lie on that, because there is a lot of data that says this is the generally, though you've got to match the child, but generally the better approach. Interesting is there isn't actually, I haven't found an actual inventory that specifically measures those three dimensions, the four dimensions. It's weird. Here she's kind of renowned, but there's no, it's weird. Anyway, what do you think? What do you think about this style of parenting? We're going to get even more into it next time, but any thoughts, feelings, fantasies, reactions? Off the top. I mean, it, it's, I feel like there's a lot of con constructs in psychology that like, make sense once you explicate them, but mm -hmm. before that, it's kind of this, you know, it makes sense that that would be the best. Okay, correct. Correct. Be weird if it wasn't. Mm -hmm. You do this and you turn out juvenile delinquents. Mm -hmm. Huh? How'd that happen? Any thoughts, fantasies, reactions? Well, I think, like, I don't have a child, but it's much easier said than done you know, when you're in the moment. <laughs> Unbelievably hard to do on a consistent basis. Unbelievably hard. Remember, remember, remember. The amygdala immediately shuts down the empathy systems. Right? We went over this, didn't we? I, you weren't here. Didn't I, did I mention that in the first class? Yeah, shuts it down. Because again, when the saber tooth was jumping at you, you didn't have time to say, nice pretty cat, and oh, you're hungry, and I look like a good meal. You didn't have time for that. Bap, and or run. So when your kid does something that pisses you off, scares you, your amygdala's firing, you're gonna, your empathy's going to reflexively shut down, some of your prefrontal cortex and logic mind's going to shut down, and you're going to react more limbically, viscerally. Stop it right now! kind of stuff. The heck do you think you're doing? Or whatever. And you're going to look mad, all that prosody stuff. You're going to smell mad. What's the reaction from the child? Fear. You bet you sweet bippy baby. You think your amygdala's firing? Oh my god, there just went on total red alert. Amygdalitis, amygdalitis. <laughs> Only guess what? They can't run. Well, if you're trying to spank them, sometimes if they're spunky, they'll run. <laughs> As you might imagine, Duran has never, uh, never been, I, I can't even barely say the word spank. I'm going to hit you? Oh my God. <laughs> Just, what right do I have to hit you? And by the way, until you never hit anybody, except in self defense. Mm -hmm. I, it's bizarre to me, but I, never mind. Um, but, well, not never mind. We'll get back to that next time more. It goes into fear and basically deer in the headlights because they usually can't run, and they can't really, there's no point in trying to argue back. So you're just trapped. Not conducive to a sense of psychological safety. Right? Your survival needs, to use Maslow's stuff, are now in play. Not your growth needs and growth drives, your survival drives. You've just gone right down to primal survival. And most of the parents don't intend that, but you're right, in the moment, oh my God, is it hard. Part of me feels like yelling. However, I know that I'll just create fear in you, so instead I will say, but I want it even better than that. Again, I want you to have, right, a new reflexive sense of the child so that you reflexively reflect, reflexively reflect back to the child. Honey pumpkin, I am so sorry. You look scared. I obviously scared you. I'm sorry. Tell me again. Let me listen. Because obviously I wasn't listening. I apologize. Tell me again. What just happened now? Migdal goes, ah, oh, okay. Oh, this is good. I'm safe here. Wow, cool. And notice I get down the child's level right away. Boom. Play therapist should have knee pads. Because you're down here. Actually, I'm more often than not, I'm more often than not like this. And a lot of times I purposely will put myself lower than the child. 
I don't know if you know about birds. Birds really like to be above wherever you are. <laughs> Kids are kind of the same way. Because you've got to remember, you've forgotten this. I know we're going to stop in a moment. You have forgotten that when you were a little pumpkin, this is how your parents looked. <laughs> get in your room right now and get your bed done now. Oh my God, you're giants. <laughs> You're huge. You're this huge human being thumping around going, rah, rah, rah. oh my God, that's freaky for a little pumpkin. <sighs> Get down on their ground. That's why you still see them as 12 foot nine. When you go home, you all of a sudden, God, I feel like I'm six years old again. <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe it. Because you know, all those associative networks that were created in the first six years, never mind 12 years of life, oh my God. So hard to reverse those. So you're right, it's very hard truly to parent with really love, warmth, really what I mean, what this means really is empathy. Empathy. I told you the other reason why we have such a hard time with empathy is again, we think in being empathic, we're somehow agreeing with the other person's position. And we don't, we don't agree with their position, so we don't want to give over to it. And again, if you told me it's raining out there and you feel really bad that you don't have an umbrella, I'm not going to say to you, no, it's not, it's sunny, you're wrong. That would not be helpful. I can say to you, wow, if you see it's raining and all that, yeah, it must be a bummer for you to not have an umbrella. I don't know if we can come up with something. It's weird, to me it looks sunny, but what matters right here for right now is how you're seeing it. So I don't have to agree with your position. I can still empathize. Okay? Getting some of this? All right. Any last minute thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions? We're good? Okay, we're good. You're writing the question. You're going to email me the question. It's a true false question per your peer bosses here. Okay, you're going to email me that question and I'll add it to the list. I look forward to have a wonderful Warm, loving, fair, limited, lots of autonomy, sharing self week. Mm -hmm. Perfect timing, perfect timing, thank you, thank you, perfect timing. Uh, now, the weird thing is, I'm not sure it recorded the first time, but I hope so.